they'll throw them away. Catherine, you want to say anything? Wait a minute. Oh, it's, it's 10. Why don't you let all those people come in? <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. My name is Catherine Costello. It's good to be together again on this Sunday after Thanksgiving. You've probably already had two days of leftovers and are feeling poised for the arrival of December 1st on Thursday. Tony is up in Massachusetts today. So uh, he's not with us this morning. We miss him. We are a welcoming congregation, freely seeking intellectual and spiritual growth. We strive to create a larger community of peace, justice, and love. If you are new to our congregation, we are grateful that you have found us. Now, you know you can't escape an entreaty to turn off your cell phones. So if you haven't yet done that, please, please, now do that. This morning, appropriately, we focus our attention on gratitude. Joanne Husky, Janet Hoffman, and I will be sharing our separate reflections on gratitude during the homily section of the service. Now that we are back in full swing here at UU, you will be seeing us assisting with the service on some Sundays. We hope you find us to be a valuable part of what happens. As I prepared for my welcome this week, my eye was caught by an opinion piece in the New York Times titled, How to Give Thanks in a Screwed Up World, by Margaret Renkel. In the intro to her essay, a New York Times senior editor observed that thanksgiving to him was not an act of mere politeness or chirpy positivity, but an act of courage and transcendence. Janet, Joanne, and I will strive to mirror Martha, Martha Renkel's words. We will let our whole hearts fill up with gratitude for what is breathtakingly beautiful about this weary, ragged world. And now, let's settle ourselves into this time of worship with the morning's prelude.
The wheel of the year has turned again. Once more, the Thanksgiving season has arrived. How shall we sing our song of gratitude now? What shall we give thanks for this moment? Yeah, please join me as we read the chalice lighting words, and Catherine will light the chalice. They should be on the screen in a few minutes, a few seconds. We light our chalice as a symbol of gratitude as we celebrate the abundance of our lives together. In this sanctuary, we harvest and offer our crop with the hands of compassion and generosity. In the gentle manner of our connection, cultivate a simple, sweet in our spirits. Grateful for the ways we nourish and of this hollow time to that sustains us. Now, please feel free to sing and lead us in a centering hymn, number 21, in the hymnal, for the beauty of the earth, the words. time to share what is in our hearts, either a joy or a sorrow. We are a caring community, and so our sharing helps to build connection. First, I would like to share a note from Liz Bebo, who is a UU member in Texas and the eldest daughter of George and Joanne Anthony. She wrote, I want, to thank, I want to share my gratitude for the kindness that the congregation bestowed upon my dad, George Anthony. Your church was a place of great comfort for him. He passed away on November 22nd while his four daughters were with him. And so many thanks to you for your compassion. 
And now, please raise your hand if you would like to share a short, personal, heartfelt joy or sorrow. Joanne or Catherine will bring the mic to you. First, please say your name, and then please only speak briefly so that we will have time for several people to speak. Thank you. Is this working? Okay. I'm Harriet Lancaster. I wanted to thank all the kindnesses from the congregation when Jim died. The cards, the emails, uh, everything was just, it helped. I mean, it's hard, but it helped. And I wanted to remind everyone that Jim's memorial here, we had one in Maryland for him, for family and friends, and we're doing the same here next Sunday at 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, good morning. My name's Alan Prokopo. I have been supporting a family in Ukraine um, since March. And uh, this, the joy this week was that the, her permission to leave Ukraine was granted. However, her father had a stroke, and she is torn between leaving Ukraine with her 11-year-old son and staying behind to support her parents. I pray for her. I'm uh, Dick Mackin, and I want to thank um, Ann Fisher for putting together a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner for us out on the pavilion. It was very, very enjoyable. Call Tony's sister in your hearts and minds because he's in Boston this weekend because his sister isn't well. So in Providence, Rhode prayers. Island. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, is there? One more here. Sure. Yeah, hi, I'm Mead Summers. Uh, I just want to share a thought about something that I found the last couple of years I've got to use help walking around now. The number of people who will go out of their way to open a door, to, to do anything to help you, is, is just amazing to me. So it's just human generosity, it's there. Doesn't always show up, but I've seen so much of it. And it thinks sometimes when I really didn't need the help, I just <laughs> let someone do it and make them feel better. <laughs> uh, so thank you for sharing. We will hold what has been spoken and what has been left unspoken in our hearts. This is from Thanksgiving and Enoughness by Dr. J. Michelson. Evolution has wired us for a bias toward negativity. This intensifies the threats, what might be lacking, and the perceived inadequacies, the not enoughness. This is very helpful in our caveman days. By exaggerating the dangers, we avoided more of them and we survived. But today, it is not helpful to ruminate on that failure or that loss or that email for at least 20 times. Tony spoke last week about that itch we often get to have more, that feeling of not having enough, another not enoughness. It may be with objects or money. It could be with the feeling of achievement, love, enlightenment, or pleasure. This drive can be helpful at times when it's used to help others or to make changes in society. But it can be challenging when we compare ourselves to others or criticize ourselves for not doing or being enough. Enoughness is more likely to be reached with meditation and or mindfulness practices. It is a sense that this body, this moment, even this life, 
can feel like enough, even though it is less than perfect. It is a moment when striving stops and you are a human being instead of a human doing. Moments like this can be reached at any time as long as we are safe, have some health, and can take a moment to pause. Gratitude also helps work against this negativity bias. Taking a look at what enough, I am enough. Consciously recognizing that there are positives in your life does not mean that everything is okay with you or the world. It means that besides all that is a mess, there can also be enough. It is a groundedness that cannot be taken away from you. A happiness that does not depend on the conditions. For all the struggles and challenges that we have endured collectively over the last few years, we have mostly survived. For all the struggles you have had personal experience, experience have survived. Are here. You have also experienced blessings, and one of those blessings is being a part of this congregation. When you arrived, Jay or Elaine um, gave you a blank. During meditation, you could be thinking of someone that you like to thank. The message is simple. He thanks for giving me a phone call. Thanks for setting up the refreshments on Sunday morning. And so, you you could either thank you for the invitation or after the service to hand deliver to someone. You could take it home, write it, and then mail it. Or you could uh, take it home and deliver it on another Sunday. So we will have a moment of quiet followed by music. During this time, you could reflect positive that is ours and think about who in the congregation you might wish to share your appreciation. Goodbye darkness, hello to the light Every morning is an end to a night Every season is bound to bring a change There's a new chance given every day and it brings it back to me Yeah, it brings it back to me Cool rain water and a breeze on my skin Bless the new air as I breathe it all in Take it from me like a stream into a sea Close my eyes and thank the wind and the trees Cause they bring it back to me yeah, they bring it back to me.
goodbye evening hello to the night I'm not seeing the wrong from the right walking blindly on a path without an end then the morning comes and leads me out again and it brings it all back to me yeah it brings it all back to me This morning called Blessing by Carrie Newcomer. And you know, because you've seen me up here before, <clears throat> poetry is one of my favorite things because language is used to its perhaps maximum potential. Fill your reverb, and that doesn't sound too promising, right? You may work with a wake with a sense, but may you wake with a sense of play. And it's also not an entreaty. It doesn't say, you should wake with a sense of play. So uh, let's take a look at this word, M-A-Y, may, and how this poet has cleverly used this word. In poetry, you know, choice is of most important. That's why poets labor over, labor over every word. The of words is also amazingly tricky in poems. With this being placed at the beginning of the sentence, may you wake with a sense of play. Grammatically, that is referred to as a modal verb, which suggests a mood. It's the possible something, but it does not get it as a certainty. It comes from a Germanic root, meaning to be strong, to be able, to have power. So you have the power, the strength, the ability. It doesn't call for divine intervention or magic or luck. It calls upon your strength, your inner strength. So, blessing by Larry Newcomer. You will hear the word seven times. May you wake with a sense of play, an exaltation of the possible. May you rest without guilt, satisfied at the end of the day. May all rough edges be smooth. If to smooth is to curl. The edges left rough when the unpolished is true and infinitely more interesting. May you wear your years like a well-tailored coat or a sassy scarf. May every year yet to come button, sewn on a hat, wear at a tilt. May the friendships you've sown grow tall as summer corn, and the things you've left behind rest quietly in the unchangeable past. May you embrace this day, not just as any old day, but as this day, your day held in trust by you in a singular place called now. I've got a roof over my head Got a warm place to sleep. 
Some nights I lie awake counting gifts instead of counting sheep. I've got a heart that can but I can't stay depressed When I remember how I'm blessed Grateful, grateful, truly grateful I am Grateful of the three is on the morning. Today, as my husband Tom down at breakfast, we bless this food and those who brought it to the table. This is not our way of saying thank you, God, for daily bread, but it is rather our expression of gratitude sent out into the of human goodness. It has taken me the awareness of how sacred food is. I no longer eat food, savor, and it has finally taken its rightful place in the foundation of my being. Food has always been sustenance in my body most of the time, of course. But I marvel that it took so long the holiness of food. Possibly ten spices in her spice rack. For sure, there was Morton salt and McCormick pepper, cinnamon, cloves, most importantly, Old Bay. How can a man make soup without Old Bay seasoning? Every night, almost without exception, the seven of us sat around our dining room table promptly at six. Typical of the late 50s and 60s, our weekly menu was a rotation of meatloaf with mashed potatoes and ketchup, tuna noodle casserole made with Campbell's mushroom soup, sloppy joes made with hamburger helper, chef boyardee sauce over spaghetti noodles. We never referred to it as pasta. Pork chops with applesauce. Grilled cheese sandwiches made with American cheese, of course, and Campbell's tomato soup, and cream chicken over rice. The only addition to the frozen peas, frozen lima beans, or frozen green beans at each meal was a dollop of margarine, not butter, after the vegetables were heated. The most common dessert was either canned fruit cocktail, instant pudding, or jello. The source of all the food we needed was, well, the grocery store, of course. All those neatly cellophoned, cellophoned, cellophaned packages of meat had nothing to do with actual living animals or the ranchers and butchers who brought it to my family. Those square boxes of frozen vegetables had nothing to do with actual humans bent over in the sun, hand-picking produce piece by piece. <clears throat> I grew up in suburbia, isolated from farming and isolated from pretty much any form of manual labor. That continued, I'm ashamed to admit, without much increased awareness of the human price of food. And beyond that, the true wonder of food, the appreciation of its amazing varieties and cultural connections was so undervalued in my life. At 70, I was still in the elementary school of passion. Cooking was my chore. I joked occasionally about my fantasy that there would be a man in my life 
who would cook for me. Six years ago, I moved to Florida. It was so bountiful that it took me literally the first three years to explore it all. Imagine how baffled I was to discover a tagine on a top shelf and having no idea what it was. The second difference this time was the pandemic of 2020. And like so many others, Tom decided to work cooking. The first time he cooked an entire meal for us, I lounged on the sofa, grinning joyously about my fantasy. In the three years of 2020, 2021, and 2022, my husband, never a conventional thinker, has explored cooking in a way that was a revolution to me. When he fills the earth, he will undertake three new recipes in a day. The kitchen strewn with gadgets and measures, scales, mixers, exotics, and liquids. The most significant difference, though, has been living a 40-minute drive from a mile where farm workers who hidden workers in the corner of our county are largely overlooked by the affluent population of Naples. <laughs> the geographic contrast of a Mali and Naples was startling to me almost the beginning of my life here. After I began to reply to how did you spend your summer was vacationing in Europe. I had no idea what picking tomatoes involves. I hid my ignorance. The University of Florida reports that more than 100,000 farm laborers across Florida are the engine driving Florida industry. But poverty in them is that of all wage South workers, between 10,000 and 25,000 a year. Tomato pickers are paid by the people, which means they pick and load tomatoes into 32-pound buckets, hoist them on their shoulder, walk them to a collection, get a plastic token for free, walk back and off into the cycle over and over for a day. They hit you between the eyes when you realize that a 32-pound bucket of tomatoes earns the worker 60 cents per bucket. An experienced picker pickers about 30 buckets per hour. That amounts to $18 for picking and carrying more than 900 pounds of produce an hour. Tom and I watch a lot of cooking shows, something inconceivable to me just six years ago. Almost every viewing leaves me open-mouthed by the ingenuity, the curiosity, the respect for food that's demonstrated by the chefs. Respect for food, of course, includes the respect due to our bountiful planet, but also respect for the people among us who do the often back-breaking work of raising animals, planting and harvesting what we need to survive and flourish. We living creatures, including the plants, are interconnected in marvelous and sometimes mysterious ways. To be blind to the interdependence is to miss much of the satisfaction of being alive. I am so glad to have awakened to the splendor of it. In a city of strangers I've got a family of friends No matter what rocks and brambles fill the way I know that they will stay until the end I feel a hand holding my hand 
It's not a hand you can see But on the road to the promised land This hand will shepherd me Though through delight and despair Holding tight and always there Grateful, grateful, truly grateful I am. Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and duly grateful. Imagine that you are an adult who has always wanted to visit France. Finally, you have the tickets for your dream vacation. You are so excited, you can barely wait for the takeoff. In preparation, you've educated yourself about the food, the tourist attractions, and you even purchased new clothes. The day that you have yearned for arrives. You walk down the ramp feeling so proud of yourself. Everything is going perfectly. After about 30 minutes in the air, the pilot comes on the speaker again. But his voice feels anxious. He begins with, I'm, I'm sorry, but... All of your muscles tighten as you think, what does this mean? The pilot elaborates, due to an international situation, we will not be able to fly to France. The airline has made arrangements to land in Switzerland. Your hotels are working on transferring your reservations. Sorry for this change in plans, but we are not able to fly you to France. Not now or in the future. To expect your dream to come true and then to lose it. What feelings that could arouse? Well, this story is analogous to what it can feel like to parents who have a child born with a disability. The feelings are similar to what I experienced with my son. And some of you have, may have had your life turned around by a disability in the family. My son was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, or ADHD, which I'll use. And this is a neurological disorder that is greatly misunderstood in society, even though it has been well researched. ADHD affects the neurotransmitters in the brain, and they are the chemical messengers that transmit electrical signals in the brain. Mal malfunctioning neurotransmitters means the lack of development in executive functioning skills, and these are pretty important skills. Some of these are planning, organizing, time management, setting priorities, emotional regulation, and being able to initiate work. I saw the struggle. ADHD can be challenging for the parents and for the people who have it. But I did not understand it fully. Having babysat, since 10 and taught for decades, I thought I knew everything about kids. As he grew older, I saw more differences with behavior, following directions, and taking responsibilities. He started getting in trouble at school. I was overwhelmed and discouraged. Why would he not listen? Well, because he couldn't. 
And how could he be so intelligent and not achieve well? Lack of executive neurotransmitters and age-appropriate executive functioning skills. Many with ADHD grow up thinking that there's something wrong with them. They can be perceived as rude, self-centered, and ill-mannered. Their symptoms are often attributed to other causes. Society may use them as having a mental ailment instead of a neurological condition. As a mother, I follow society's norms. I started a support group to help children with ADHD. I met many admirable people struggling from each other, hearing what worked and what didn't. I began to observe the side of ADHD. Learned that those with ADHD can have the ability to they are to be risk takers, to experiment, discover new ideas, and even create inventions. Greater curiosity about my I regret about his feelings and his perceptions. Thankfully, he was in which with me. Changing my attitude one learn from him and helped, and working together to solve problems built our relationship. So gradually, my understanding of ADHD was reframed. I see myself as an adept, urgent worker, creative, and intelligent. There have been numerous instances where he found the solution to a problem when I was clueless. He has always been intuitive, easily understanding others' feelings and motives. My neighbors call him their counselor as he actively listens to them. He is highly respected and valued where he has worked for the last seven years. I am beholden to him for my open-mindedness, lack of judgmentalism, and patience. He has taught me about perseverance, hope, and change. So, I never visited France, but I grew, benefited from, and appreciated my trip to Switzerland. <laughs> I stopped asking, why is this happening to me? and I started embracing the positives. I have loved my journey, even though it involved some tough mountain climbing. The struggle built strength. The views were spectacular. In being open to wonder and learning, one can find opportunity no matter where you go. Grateful, <clears throat> grateful, truly grateful I am. Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and duly grateful. It's not that I don't want a lot or hope for more, or dream of more. But giving thanks for what I've got makes me so much happier than keeping score in a world that can bring pain. I will still take each chance for what I believe that whatever the terrain our feet can learn to dance whatever stone life may sling 
We can moan or we can sing. Grateful, grateful, truly grateful I am. Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and duly grateful. Truly blessed and duly grateful. Good morning. I'm Joanne Husky. And the story that I'm actually going to share with you is a true story that had a very big effect on my life and changed my attitude about life. And it's a little tough in the beginning, so bear with me because it gets better. <clears throat> so, uh, in 1998, I was in the American Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, with my two little children who were five and eight at the time. And they were going to the doctors to have their school physical. And my husband, Jim, was in the ambassador's office on the top floor of this huge embassy. And after we were in the building for about a minute, the entire building was, and my husband, all climbed out of that embassy, and we survived. Now, 224 people died that day, and 4,500 people were injured, including so many Kenyans who were in the periphery of the embassy at the time. Um, and when I came out of the embassy, I was around uh, the uh, rim of the building, and there was so much destruction and death and fire all around me. I thought to myself, this is as bad as it can get. Well, <laughs> now, I, I just going to go further to that trauma, because we've all through so many traumas in the last few years, COVID, and hurricane. But I really want to tell you about what happened to me after, because I think it might give you a sense of how to cope with your own traumas and give you a little strength to carry on after all the things happened in the last few years here both and so I'm really depressed I've got three I could have wanted I decided right then that I was gonna go for the good get away was going for the good and I grabbed my kids hands I ran away from that Lot of and as you have, but for the woman, another an Irish Catholic woman, noticed her, that her eyes were just incredibly beautiful. And I kept going back, like week after week, I'd go and I'd just be there, and it was just like transforming me. I, I, I couldn't believe what I was feeling. I felt, you know, this incredible preciousness of my children and the love of my husband, and the support of my friends. It just grew, grew in terms of the gratitude I had around me. I think the irony of this is always there. It's always there all around me. And I don't know whether it took the trauma that I met these people, and they told me their stories, and I told them my stories, and there was this just incredible feeling of humanity, even though we had all suffered. And again, that healing feeling, it was so healing and it was so beautiful. So each of you, each of us, and these amazing little things like birds that were flying in the sky were essential. That was essential to us. Hurricane Ian again has challenged us, and so many of you here 
have experienced loss, whether you've lost your things, your homes, your cars, or your amenities that you're so used to having. But that's all just stuff. What we really found during it again, really mattered with connecting to friends and or taking a wonderful walk with you out or or going out to dinner and having a meal or, or uh, just having a conversation with somebody. These truly essential things when all of our things were really digitized because just They are all the same. We can be grateful. This gratitude, thanksgiving. To stop rushing, take a deep breath. Focus not on the hardness that we all have, but on that which for which you are really grateful. And it might even help to write it down in a gratitude journal, something like I am grateful for. Let's take the time, take a breath, <clears throat> and truly pay attention because it's all out there, just waiting for us. we take time to think about the words of today's message, let's also take time to express our gratitude for this place, for all the ways that it nurtures us and for all that it does out in the outside world. Today's offering will be gratefully received. Please considering, consider, uh, all of you at home, please consider sending uh, your offering, your contribution. Uh, the words of how to contribute are on the screen. <clears throat> when I'm worried and I can't sleep I count my blessings instead of sheep And I fall asleep counting my blessings As they slumble, fall asleep counting your blessings I about a nursery and I pick her curly heads and one by one as they number in their bed if you're worried and you can't sleep just count your blessings in instead of sheep and you'll fall asleep counting your blessings
much happening here in this community. Uh, you may, if you don't get the email news, you should get it because all of the things are listed, but I'll give you a few of the things to note. It's time now for the Holiday Giving Tree Project. This year, the Holiday Giving Tree is gonna support 40 fucking. Um, and again, first, there's a Giving Tree table out in the lobby, so you can just visit them and write a check if you'd like to. Um, please write Giving Tree 22 in the memo line and make it out to UUCGN. Um, that will be here today and also next week. La next week is the last week you can support this effort. You can also send a check in, make a check into our UUCGN office, or if you get the newsletter link, you can click on donate on the link and make a contribution that way. Wonderful Wednesdays is also resumed. And uh, Tony is going to be doing a three-part series on the practice of Unitarian Universalism on this coming Wednesday, and a series uh, with in January, January 7th and 25th. So you can attend one or all of us, and it's a great way to learn about what Unitarian Universalism is and, and all the details actually practice here. So mark your calendar for the day music sponsored by the music committee for 14th. And which Flo is very instrumental in for many, many years, carries on. And uh, the next session will be December 4th at 12 after service. Um, <clears throat> the Harvard Business Review called Fair Food Grant founded by the College of the Mockley Work, one of the most important social impact stories of the past century. So we here will be privileged to hear firsthand from some of those sources, uh, Judge Espinosa and Lupe Gonzalo. Uh, so that will be here in person next weekend after the service. Also, if you've noticed out in the lobby, there's art. There's always artwork. Um, being displayed. Um, this is a chance for, for you to make your mark at UUCGN. If you'd like to uh, make a bid on that um, and buy that piece of art, that will support our church, that will support this congregation. Um, the highest bidder would get to take that artwork home. So it, again, you can uh, contact Joan Isol if she's here. And um, there she is. And uh, make your check out with make your mark at UUCGN in the memo line. So, let's, you would like to take a few more to send to people outside of our congregation, feel free because I think we have some more. Abby. <laughs> For all that is our life, we give our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good. And make our own days. For need, for service, give. For work and rewards, for hours of love, we come with thanks. For all that is our life, for sorrow, for failures and loss, for each new thing we Fearful hours that pass, we come with praise and thanks for all that is our life. For all that is our life, we sing and praise for all life is a gift which we use to build a and make our own days glad. B, who are 
of stars and find ourselves yet another day. May we recall with gratitude and wonder all that has given us life. Thank you.